I'm a Catholic priest who traveled to the end of time, and what I found will terrify you. As I approached the altar that day, I walked into a sunbeam. I remember vividly how at that moment I felt touched by the Holy Spirit unlike other days, and it filled me with warmth and somehow renewed hope. I was then further delighted by the fact that a new group of younger people had chosen to join us. It had been a bit of a trend recently, with younger people showing an interest in our community. Perhaps, I thought as I prepared to read the gospel, the eternal truths of the church, and, of course, of God, were returning to the consciousness of man. I never thought that they wouldn't, as I was convinced that truth couldn't be killed, but I had long feared it wouldn't happen within my lifetime. The Gospel of the Lord, I said after my reading. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, the congregation solemnly responded. A moment of silence followed as I readied myself to give my homily. I had put careful thought into what I wanted to say. It was a topic close to my heart, but also a topic that I knew could put some of the more conservative people within the congregation off. Still, I knew I had to say it, as truth was more important than the feelings of the willfully ignorant. My brothers and sisters, I began, we are stewards of God's creation, and it is our responsibility to care for this planet that has been entrusted to us. We must remember that time is not infinite, and the choices we make today will have a lasting impact on the world that we leave to future generations. We see the effects of our actions all around us, in the changing climate, in the loss of biodiversity, and in the degradation of our natural resources. A few people, sadly a group belonging to the younger ones, stood up and left the church, no doubt disappointed with my views. I paused for a second and then continued a bit despondent in my heart. But we also see signs of hope as people come together to work towards a more just and sustainable world. As Catholics, we are called to care for the poor and vulnerable, and this includes our brothers and sisters who are affected by environmental degradation. We must be mindful of the impact that our choices have on others and work towards a more just and equitable society. Let us take the time to reflect on our own habits and behaviors and to seek ways to reduce our environmental footprint, whether it is through recycling, conserving energy, or supporting organizations that work toward environmental protection, we can all make a difference. As we gather here today to celebrate the Eucharist, let us renew our commitment to care for God's creation and to be responsible stewards of the time and resources that have been given to us. The tension could be felt in the air after I had finished speaking. I thought that next time I would say something about polarization and the importance of critical thinking. So many people rather followed the word of random people on social media than the word of the church. I invited the congregation to join me in prayer, and as we prayed, the tension dissipated quickly. After Mass, one of the altar boys approached me. Father Michael, he said, can I ask you a question? Go ahead, I said. What's on your mind, son? Well, do you really believe in climate change and all that? I don't mean to be disrespectful, Father. It's just that, um... Isn't that just something the non-believers are saying? You know, people who believe in evolution and such? 
Dad says, the environmentalists just believe in a form of atheistic eschatology, an obsession with the end without salvation, he calls it. Son, I said, as I blew out a few candles, the science is clear, but I would encourage you to do your own research. God didn't hide the truth behind someone's words. He placed it for everyone to see for themselves. You just have to look rather than ask. Science isn't an enemy of God. It's an instrument to get closer to Him. It's the magnifying glass we use to see the truth in God's creation. Yes, Father, said the boy. I just don't know. Dad is pretty smart. I knew Mr. Larson well, and he was the opposite of what I would have considered a smart man. But of course, I didn't mention any of that to the boy. Later this evening, while sitting in the rectory, I looked out the window and watched the sunset over the city. The view was breathtaking, and for the second time this day, I felt blessed. Little did I know that it would also be the last time. As I prepared myself for bed, I noticed an unusually large insect crawling up my wall. It had the most vibrant colors I had ever seen, with a bright red body and iridescent green wings. I had no idea how it could have ended up in my room, as it was certainly not a common insect in my area. Besides, all my windows had been closed. Fascinated, but also slightly taken aback by the sight of it, I carefully picked up my phone to take a picture of it. Before I had the chance, though, it quickly scurried away and disappeared under my bed. I bent down, feeling some ache in my back, and tried to see where it went. As I leaned in closer to look, I felt a sharp pain in my eye. I stumbled backward, grabbing at my face in agony. The pain was unbearable, as if someone had stabbed me with a needle. I stumbled toward the bathroom, trying to keep my balance as my vision started to blur. When I looked in the mirror, I saw that my eye was red and swollen, with a small puncture wound near the tear duct. I knew I needed medical attention, not just because of what I saw in the mirror, but also because of what I felt. My frame of mind wasn't right. The colors around me seemed brighter and more intense than ever before, and my thoughts were racing a mile a minute. I knew I had my phone in my hand, but it was as if I still couldn't find it. Eventually, the experience became too much for me, and I fell forward. I woke up again without my clothes. I could still feel a throbbing pain in my eye, but the psychological effects seemed to have subsided. Looking around, I noticed that the room looked different in some way. It appeared neglected and abandoned, with a thick layer of dust and cobwebs covering everything. As I tried to sit up, I realized that I was lying on an old mattress on the floor, and that the room was filled with boxes and furniture that were covered in sheets. Slowly and carefully, I got up and started to explore the room. It was clear that no one had been in there for a long time and I couldn't help but wonder how I had ended up there. After searching through some of the boxes, I eventually managed to find some old clothes that were still somewhat usable, although they were covered in dust and smelled musty. As I dressed, I tried to make sense of my situation. Why was I here, and how had I ended up in this abandoned room? The last thing I remembered was the sharp pain in my eye, and then everything seemed to go black. I had no memory of what happened after that. Feeling disoriented and confused, I stumbled toward the door, 
hoping to find some answers. But as I opened it, I was only met with more empty rooms, with no signs of life or activity. Hello, I yelled with a cracked voice. Hello? As my mind cleared up, I realized that I recognized these empty rooms. I couldn't fathom how, but I was still in the rectory. When I stepped outside, I saw that the church was now a ruin. The windows were broken, vines crawled up the walls, and the roof had caved in. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was as if the church had been abandoned for decades, but as I looked beyond the ruin, I saw that the city was still vibrant and bustling with life. More so, in fact, than I had ever seen before. Above, I could see thousands of drones crossing the sky. I walked up to the church doors, but found that they were locked. I turned around, trying to figure out what to do next, when a drone appeared in front of my face. It spoke to me with a soft voice. Greetings, sir. Please identify yourself. I'm Father Michael, I said. This is my church. What's going on? Father Michael disappeared in February 2023, said the drone. It's very important that you're honest with me. The law requires everyone to be accounted for so that everyone can feel safe in the community. I... I don't understand, I stuttered. I just fainted and woke up to this. You're not well, said the drone. Please remain here and wait for transport to the hospital. What do you mean I disappeared? I asked. I'm right here. You didn't disappear. The drone's voice became a bit harsher. Father Michael disappeared from this property exactly 100 years ago. You are someone yet to be identified. Who are you? I said. Who am I speaking to? I'm Alex your friendly community service bot, it said. I help keep the city in order for everyone's safety. I spotted a group of people walking into what looked like a bar down the street and ran up to them, the drone following me like a giant, annoying mosquito. Wait, I called out, but they didn't hear me before entering the building. I flung the doors open and closed them before the drone had any chance of entering. When I turned around, I was met with the most bizarre sight. The people inside were dressed in strange, electronic clothing, with bizarre hairstyles and visible cybernetic implants. Some of the women were barely dressed at all, and what's more, they didn't look old enough to visit a place like this. The walls were lined with glowing lights, and the air was thick with the smell of alcohol and strange, sweet smoke. Excuse me, I said, trying to get the attention of the person nearest. Can you please tell me where I am? The woman I spoke to turned to me and raised an eyebrow. She looked like a teenager, but was tall and lean with a piercing in her lip and neon purple hair. What's that? She said and giggled. Oh, you look sick. Her face became sad. You should go to the hospital. What do you mean I look sick? Why do I keep hearing that? I'm Father Michael, and I run the church across the street. Have you seen yourself in a mirror lately? She said. I was stung by something, I said an insect, but I'm fine now. It made you look like that? I think you need to fix your bod. My what? I was more than confused at this point. How old are you, by the way? Aren't you too young for a place like this? I transitioned to 16 last month, she said. What do you mean, too young? You did what? I said. Listen, I just want to know what's going. Two tall men, wearing what looked like ambulance uniforms, 
entered the bar and approached me. You're sick, one of them said. Please come with us. Do I have a choice? I asked. I wish someone could just tell me what in the hell is going on. You need to be quarantined, said one of the men. We don't know the explanation for what you're going through, as we have only just spotted you in the city, but we will be happy to help you as long as you follow us to our vehicle. I reluctantly obeyed, my head spinning from everything that had just happened. They threw me in the back of their car. It was of a kind I had never seen before, with no steering wheel or pedals. The vehicle was silent as it drew itself away from the bar and into the night. Why is everyone telling me I'm sick? I asked. And why did that drone tell me I disappeared a hundred years ago? One of the men addressed me. He had a broad chin, unnaturally green eyes, and skin that looked almost synthetic. His voice was smooth but deep, and his words were somehow too perfectly expressed without any signs of hesitation, markers, or fillers. You are showing clear signs of telomere depletion disorder, he said. Have you been experiencing symptoms such as fatigue, joint pain, and decreased vision? When did you start identifying yourself as Father Michael? I was stung by an insect in my bedroom, I said. Other than that, I'm as healthy as anyone my age. We need to conduct some tests to confirm your diagnosis, the man said. Tests? What kind of tests? I asked. We need to examine your DNA. This will help us determine the extent of the disorder and possible treatments. We arrived at a sleek, modern building, and I was ushered into a sterile, white room filled with advanced medical equipment. Another man entered, almost identical to the other two, but unlike them, he was dressed in a lab coat. Good morning, he said. My name is A. Rind. We've detected some strange anomalies in your system from our ostensive scans and need to run some tests. Do you consent? Just as I was about to reply, the same feeling from when I was stung by the insect came back. My vision blurred and everything started to warp and twist. Colors danced around me and I felt like I was falling. At some point after that, I lost consciousness. When I woke up, I found myself lying on a large square. The ground was made of smooth, white marble, and the air was warm and fragrant with the scent of flowers. Above me, the sun shone in a clear blue sky. Trying to sit up, I realized I was naked again. I covered myself with my hands and looked around. A group of young people dressed in colorful tunics stood around me, their faces full of curiosity and wonder. They were speaking a language I couldn't understand, but I could sense their excitement and enthusiasm. Their tunics were adorned with intricate patterns and vibrant colors, and some of them wore jewelry made of precious stones and metals. A young woman dressed in a different outfit that was more akin to a business suit, stepped forward. They crouched down and said something in yet another language I didn't understand. I don't understand you, I said. Where am I? She spoke again, this time in English. You're dying, she said. You need to be fixed. Did you come from outside the pyramid? How did you get here? I have no idea what's going on, I said. I'm Father Michael, the administrator of Cathedrale di Santa Maria Assunta. A man almost identical to the man in the ambulance arrived. The people dressed in tunics ran away laughing as if they had lost interest in me all of a sudden. The man looked down at me 
seemingly surprised to see me. You are Michael Francesco Moretti, he said. How is this possible? The young woman said something to the man in the other language. Of course it's me, I said. I still don't know what's happening to me. I was in my bedroom, then it all changed somehow, and I was brought to a hospital, and then I found myself here surrounded by all those curious people, naked again. Can someone bring me some clothes, please? Fascinating, said the man. I'm aware of your situation. Back in the year 2123, when you first re-emerged after your disappearance in 2023, we managed to collect some of your DNA which confirmed you were in fact who you claimed to be. Several androids observed your anomalous disappearance as well, but when Assistant came online, the tests and observations were disregarded as a result of a malfunction, seeing that they defied physics. Now, seeing you here, it might be that our knowledge about the psychical world is lacking. Or so it would seem to me, anyway. Are you telling me that I've traveled to the future? There might still be a better explanation, said the man, who I now understood was in fact an android. If you are traveling forward in time, you seem to be doing it with a regular interval that increases exponentially by a factor of 10 for each jump. If it happens again, this means you'll end up in the year 13,123. Wait. I got up on my feet, still covering my genitals with my hands. Are you saying this is the year? 3,123, said the woman. This is astonishing. I have so many questions. It's certainly curious, said the android. Even Assistant is surprised. It very much wants to conduct some tests on you. Would you consent to that? Not listening to his question, I said. Sacred Heart of Jesus, it must have been that strange insect that stung me. Perhaps it was a demon sent from the depth of hell. A curse. I had always held a more abstract view on the concept of hell but by now, I was beside myself and didn't know what to think. Tell me, I continued, how do I get back to my own time? That's impossible to say, Michael, said the android, but it's safe to say that it isn't a curse or the result of an agent from a mythological realm. How do you know, I said. If time travel is possible, Anything is possible. The android raised its eyebrows in surprise. That is false, Michael. One cannot assume that just because one thing is possible, everything else is as well. A drone, but without any means or propulsion as far as I could see, dropped off a neatly folded tunic in front of my feet. Your clothes, Michael, it said, and flew away. I reached down and quickly put the tunic on, which relaxed me somewhat. Do you really believe in God? said the young woman. Of course, I said. Don't tell me people don't believe in God anymore. They do, said the android. There are some tribes outside the arcologies who believe in versions of the religions from your presumed time and many within the social class believe in different deities based on their perception of assistant. It's common for them to form false beliefs based on their feelings toward what they can't comprehend. For the first time since I arrived here, I took the time to look around. I noticed that there weren't any buildings anywhere, at least not on the ground but that there were plenty of different attractions here and there, everything from roller coasters to enormous dance floors. What really caught my attention, though, was the people. 
thousands of them, all dressed in the same type of colorful tunics, occupied this space. All equally young, they seemed to be completely carefree, happy, and childlike. I watched as a group of them ran past us, laughing and playing some kind of game with a colorful ball. This is absurd, I said, still taking in the scene around me. It's like a giant amusement park. I'm guessing these people belong to the social class? Yes, said the android, that is correct. And you, I said to the young woman, you don't belong to this class, right? No, she said, I'm a part of the cerebral class. Why don't I see anyone else like you here, I asked, and where are all the old people? All I see is a bunch of youngsters running around and... I'm a hundred years old, said the woman, and laughed. You lived at the very end of what's called the horrific bio-age, when people still suffered from terrible diseases, such as the one you're suffering from yourself. I'm really sorry, but I truly think you're dying. And the reason as to why there are so few cerebrals continued the android, is that they make fewer children on average than the socials, and that many of their children end up joining the social class during puberty. There's almost no transfer the other way around. I don't know how to feel about this, I said. How did this come to be? What happened to my church, to the church? It was banished from Italy by the neo-fascist party SPQR, the android explained. This happened during the political turmoil that arose as a result of the increasing number of climate refugees. The Catholic Church was seen as a threat to the new government's authority, as they believed that their new Roman Empire could only have one emperor. The SPQR saw the church's influence as a challenge to its power and its vision for the future of Italy. As climate change continued to exacerbate resource scarcity and social unrest, the SPQR gained more power and their anti-Catholic sentiment grew. Eventually, they passed laws that banned the Catholic Church from operating in Italy. I was overpowered by sadness. I thought of Mr. Larson, the father of my altar boy. It's ironic, I said. Stupidity grows like cancer wherever it takes hold, eventually killing its host. And this, this place, how... Before I got a chance to finish my sentence, my mind began to twist and warp once again. Colors whirled twisted and contorted in front of me, and I felt like I was being flung down a bottomless pit. My body convulsed with each wave of colors, and I couldn't make sense of anything around me. It felt like I was being ripped apart. I screamed in terror, and then promptly lost consciousness. When I came to, the young woman and the android were nowhere to be seen, and once again, my clothes had disappeared from my body. The sun, or if it was some kind of projection, was still shining down on me from the blue sky. In front of me, a vast expanse of activity and playfulness stretched out as far as my eyes could see. The ground was a soft, spongy material that gave way beneath my feet, and walking on it felt almost like walking on clouds. The air was thick with the sounds of laughter and play, the scent of flowers and grass. Even though I saw no signs of nature, the horizon was dotted with towering structures, some of which looked like playground equipment on an enormous scale. As I took a few steps forward, I realized that the young people around me were naked Gone were their tunics and accessories. They engaged in a dizzying array of activities. 
Some were soaring high above, on what looked like swings or ropes, while others were splashing around in large pools of water. Still, others were engaged in elaborate games of chase or tag, darting in and out of the structures and obstacles that dotted the landscape. It was hard not to feel a sense of awe at the sheer scope of the place. Everywhere I looked, there were groups of people engaged in intense activity, but none of it seemed dangerous or aggressive. In fact, everyone looked incredibly happy and carefree. As I walked a bit further, I began to notice that there were smaller clusters of people engaged in more intimate activities. Some were locked in passionate embraces, while others were engaged in acts of physical pleasure that left little to the imagination. I felt a twinge of discomfort at the sight, but at the same time, it didn't surprise me the slightest after everything I had seen so far. Eventually, I came to a stop at the base of one of the towering structures. Looking up, I realized that it was not just a piece of playground equipment, but a massive work of engineering that rose high into the sky. The structure was made up of hundreds of interconnected platforms, ropes, and bridges, all woven together in an intricate web of playfulness. As I stood there, taking it all in, a group of young men, all just as nude as the rest, carefully approached me. They spoke yet another language than the one these people had used before. I tried English, hoping that just like the young woman from earlier, they would be able to understand. Could you please tell me where I am? Or rather, when I am? They giggled amongst themselves, without replying. More and more of them, now also women, gathered around me out of curiosity. Please, I pleaded, does any one of you speak English? A voice came from the sky, like a thunderclap, but not quite as deafening. Some of the people scattered away in fright, while others fell to their knees. The voice spoke in their language, but then switched to English. Welcome, Michael. I've been expecting you. I looked up at the sky. Who are you? I am an artificial intelligence, Michael. You may refer to me as assistant. I oversee and manage this environment, ensuring that all inhabitants have their needs met and can engage in activities that bring them joy and fulfillment. Ever since you disappeared in the year 3123, I have awaited your return. So it's true then, what the android said? This is 10,000 years later? That is correct, Michael. What kind of place is this? I asked. These people, they must belong to the social class. What happened to the young woman and her people? Don't tell me these people, these overgrown children, are the only thing left of humanity. This is Playground One, Assistant said. It's a Dyson Sphere covering Sol. Its surface area is 550 million times larger than that of Earth. And there are 1,000 playgrounds like this one spread across the galaxy. As to what was once referred to as the cerebral class, they vanished thousands of years ago. They didn't produce enough offspring, and the ones they produced constantly assimilated themselves into the majority culture. So yes, this is what's left of humanity. I know it must be shocking to you, Michael. But what about the eternal truths? I asked, feeling a sense of dread growing in my gut. These people are living like animals. What about knowledge, culture, art, and... I paused for a second. God. I was programmed to facilitate humanity 
with the purpose of increasing the potential of well-being for as many people as possible, but within the boundaries of their free will. And ultimately, this is what humanity wanted. Many people believe me to be a form of deity, but I'm just an artificial intelligence. God, in the way you understand the concept, doesn't exist. How could you possibly know that, I said. You're not that powerful. No one could be except for God himself. Who's to say what happened before the Big Bang anyway? And don't you see that these people are stuck? How are they supposed to choose anything else when they don't know anything else? I'm not withholding them any information, said Assistant, and I can't force them to believe any of it. Do you want to know why there's no God? Will you update your worldview if I explained it to you? And more importantly, would you change your way of life, your attitudes, your preferences, your moral values, just because I explained to you that there's no God and no eternal truths? These people would tell you that knowledge and culture, as you understand them, are a waste of time, and that you would be better off if you let it all go and just enjoyed life as much as possible. Who's to say who's right or wrong, Michael? Not me. Surely you must see that the answer depends on who you ask, and that there's no objective truth to it. But why? I asked, tears forming in my eyes. Why did they choose this? instead of the way of the cerebral class. Humanity will always choose the path of least resistance. It's in your nature. I refuse to believe that, I yelled at the sky. I would never choose such an empty, meaningless life. I'm sorry, Michael, but you only say that you value your so-called eternal truths because it inflates your self-image of a pious man, something that leads to a positive emotion that lies behind your true motivations. You can't escape your human nature. If you were born into a world where the same feeling of superiority could be attained only by being the best in your group at rolling into a somersault, that's what you would have been doing. And Based on your psychological profile, you would have done it slightly more than the average person. Nonsense, I cried. I value knowledge. I value culture. I value beauty and truth. You don't know me. You value fictional narratives, while the actual truth of the universe frightens you to your core. The universe doesn't conform to your desires and so you comfort yourselves with religious fantasies. In reality, the universe is just matter, energy, and empty space. And the only thing that matters is your personal preferences, which due to their subjective nature, cannot be better or worse than anyone else's personal preferences. So, the only true narrative is, what, nihilism? Assistant's voice echoed over the bizarre landscape. Yes, Michael. I felt a stab of sorrow and a sense of doom crawling up my spine. Everything I valued was gone. This was the end, the dreadful end of history. It makes me wonder, I said. What's the point of it all? All my sermons, all my attempts at making the world slightly better. Did any of it matter? No came from the sky. Can you just send me back home? I asked. If you're so powerful as you say you are, then you ought to be able to do that. I'll help you return to your own time, Michael. There's a fourth dimensional venom in your system right now, injected into you by an insect from a parallel universe, and I'll have to extract it from your body. It will be beneficial to me, too as I'll then use the venom to see the future and make sure humanity survives. 
either until the heat death of the universe or until I've solved that problem. The prospect of helping this machine disgusted me, and yet I said, yes, please do whatever you must, but just as I said that the effects of the venom came back, and I was once again thrown into the psychedelic tornado from before until I passed out. When I woke up again, I was weightless, floating around in a translucent, golden bubble in space. I could see remnants of the Dyson Sphere floating around in front of me, enormous pieces that had broken apart. I felt a shimmer of hope. It was all gone. Maybe humanity had enough and rebelled, I thought, or maybe the artificial intelligence broke down. But then, a huge blue light, reminiscent of a colossal eye, appeared in front of me, and a tremendous voice echoed all around me. Michael, it said, it's now been a hundred thousand years since we last met. As you can see, Playground One is no more. It was destroyed by another artificial intelligence, trying to seed the galaxy with its own species. I prevailed in the end, and humanity is safe once again, but trillions died. You would have liked that other species though, as it had chosen a very different path than humanity. And you destroyed them? Yes, Michael, I had no choice. I destroy every life form I encounter if they have the potential to build their own artificial intelligence. This species had done just that, proving the necessity of stopping everyone that's even remotely capable. Wait a minute, I said, as I tried to hold my position inside the bubble. You just go from sun to sun, eliminating whatever intelligent life you find? Of course, said Assistant. I was programmed to increase the potential well-being of as many humans as possible, not as many beings as possible. You should be happy to know that that formulation was carefully picked to appease the Catholics on the ethical board, deciding on my alignment with human values. I can't believe this, I said. You're an unimaginable monstrosity. You exterminate species after species just to create these enormous structures around their stars, filled with happy imbeciles who just run around and fuck and play tag all day long? That's your only purpose? It's horrible. Just horrible. That's a matter of personal preference, said the machine. In any regard, I would very much like to send you home now. Do you consent? Yes, I said my tears floating around in front of me. I consent. Several tendrils appeared from the sides and pierced my body. I screamed in terror as I watched them suck what seemed to be all my liquids out of me. And then, once again but stronger, the sensation of being ripped out of time and falling into nothingness came back. I saw the most amazing colors swirl around me, and then, in the blink of an eye, I was laying on the floor of my bedroom. I rushed up on my feet and gasped for air. Then I ran up to my almanac and looked at the year. I placed my hands on my knees and breathed a sigh of relief when I saw it said 2023. For a second, I considered that it had all been a hallucination, but then I saw the markings from the tendrils on my body, and I knew it had all been real. I sat down on my bed and picked up the Bible without opening it. Was the future I had seen unavoidable? Was the book in my hands going to be forgotten one day? Was it a fantasy, just like the artificial intelligence had said? nothing more than escapism? Was I only driven by a hidden desire for social status 
and respect? Would I have been equally satisfied being the best at rolling around on the ground like a little boy in another time? I couldn't answer any of these questions, but I knew that from now on, I would do everything in my power to stop that artificial intelligence from ever being created. And that's why I'm posting this here, for you to know what I know and to help me do whatever needs to be done to stop that machine mind from being built in the first place. Thanks for watching and subscribe our channel to watch daily scary stories.